ever, but it seems like to some extent it's even gotten worse in some areas. How do you analyze movement, Mike, and how do you ensure safe return of function and assess those outcomes? Well, back up uh, to the question a little bit. Sure. This, I know we've talked in the past about this and, and talked about the recurrence rates of injury. And, and just to put a couple things in perspective, because it really boggles my mind, this, these, these two or three uh, numbers I've shared. But if you were looking at the best predictor of injury, and we're talking about healthy, more recreational athletic people, to all the way to the highest level, doesn't really matter. But this is fascinating. You can look at all different variables to try to predict injury or use these modeling. The one thing that's a constant across all studies is that, or the number one predictor of injury is the fact, or has the person had a previous injury? And the data is gonna be all over the board. There's lots of studies, but the data says, if you've had a previous injury, you're, you're somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 19 times more likely to suffer an additional injury. Now, the reason you say, well, that's a huge range when you're looking at two to 19 times, and it is a large range, but it's because if you mix in all sports, obviously, if somebody's going back to a collision sport or a high stressful sport, if you're on the high end, if you're going back to something less stressful, working, or, uh, industrial, whatever, it's, it's, you're going to be on the low end. So that tells me there, there's something going on here. Either something fundamentally changes within the neuromuscular system after injury, and there is changes we know that occurs, or we're not. Uh, truly rehabilitating these people like we think we are. And I, I, I think it probably falls into the latter, or at least I'm going to take some of the blame on that one. I, don't I think on that one. one. We're not. And, and it gets back to what I said a little bit ago. I think we focus on this isolated joint function. We're really good when somebody comes in asking about their pain, and we use pain science or whatever you want, but we can talk about that, and we can look at range of motion, we can look at strength, we can do whatever about a joint. But that doesn't mean they're going to move better or they're going to function any better when they get back into their home environment or doing things. And that's where we've got to start looking at the big picture with this. Even, even things as simple, people like to, you know, you, you, as, a, as a physical therapist or all of us in this room as healthcare providers, you like to think that after you discharge somebody, if they don't come back and see you, they probably got better. It's our, our natural thought process. Well, maybe they didn't get better and they wouldn't saw some, they were smart enough to go see somebody else and do things. And when you look at it, but if you look at even on these numbers with, again, non-senior population, but just to make the point is, although this does happen more and more as we get into a healthier senior population, but anterior cruciate ligament tears. I mean, if you look at the data now, Upwards to, to between 20 to 30 percent of these people that have had surgery will re rupture their graft or tear on the opposite side. Again, that falls back to think we're doing a poor job. So, now what do we do about it? Well, I think Kevin brought up the case, and, and Kevin was giving us a, a patient example, and we we're going through and, and talking about it. But that example he was using could be applied to everybody across the lifespan for all practical purposes because not only do we tend to think of things in a um, uh, isolated joint function, we tend to do things in that linear manner as well. We don't work multi-direction. We don't work all different things. And again, it's probably because we haven't had the ability to do things like that uh, and done those, the, uh, work those ways. So again, things I would do back to, to your, sure. your point is we look at various things, and I know it's going to be a theme as we go through this, this presentation as we share ideas, but uh, we use the tracer with pretty much all of our patients. And I love the multi-directional testing we can do, but it gives us in, uh, four variables that I look at all the time. Reaction to a stimulus, so to, to do something. I look at acceleration, that, that does help me. In our senior population, I look a lot at speed, with how, well, how fast can they move? We heard the bumpers and, and, and doing this. Speed correlates directly with our function. And then I do look at the deceleration component as well. And I think there's a big element to that as we get more and more into it for injury uh, prevention or sure. causing problems after the fact so we, as we rehabilitate. So I think, it, you know, to sort of answer your question, I, I think we're able to look at things a little better and put values to it, identify, and I know we'll probably hear this even more, but uh, identify. And as a clinician, I think by doing that and looking multi-direction or having the ability to look multi-direction, it makes me much more efficient in the clinic. And we can focus on the true impairments the person has to improve their overall function. If I didn't have a tool to do that, uh, if you wanted to be comprehensive, I've got to use a shotgun approach and use everything I could possibly do, which is not efficient in this day and age clinically. It's just not efficient. So really take them out of the 